it's a perfect opportunity to for me to introduce our next and final speaker, Yana, Yaya Fanusi, who's going to give us our closing keynote. As you probably realized from today's presentations, DeFi poses a really direct challenge and an opportunity via technology transformation to both commercial and governmental institutions. And FinTech is clearly developing into a DeFi into competing spheres around the world. And this relates to and creates implications for global governance and global security. Yaya is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and an expert on the national security issues raised by blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So for, for now, we'll introduce uh, Yaya to give us our closing keynote for the conference. Thank you very much for joining us, Yaya. Thank you, Kathleen. It's great to be here. I know it's been quite an interesting, quite a great lineup. I'm happy to follow uh, after Jonathan because I think, interestingly, a lot of my comments that you'll see uh, really, really tie in to what Jonathan laid out uh, as it relates to China. Um, so if you give me a few seconds, hopefully everyone can hear me OK. And I'm going to set up my screen uh, so that you can see it. Great. All right, so let us get this started. Um, and it's interesting because, as Kathleen mentioned, talking about you know DeFi, you know the a key point that I think we're going to get into with uh, with my talk here is that we're really talking. You know, we can't talk about decentralized fi finance in a vacuum. We're talking about the the growth of different formats of digital money. So so let's think a little bit about what's happening here, which is really that I'm going to talk about the national security side of all of this. I you know, worked in the Intel community years, years ago, and my focus is on uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, digital assets as they relate to U.S. national security. So I'm going to talk about these different formats for digital money, talk about um, uh, CBDCs in particular, central bank digital currencies, short term and long term, and also um, China's experimentation, which Jonathan really teed up very well, and data. And the ending question is, how do we deal with the threat of digital authoritarianism, right? That's, I think, what a lot of us are going to be thinking about. So I'll start with this, which, number one, digital money is not new. Um, we've always had, or not always, but we, we've had for the past you know, multiple decades, digital money, um, whether it was you know, uh, online banking or whatnot. But what, what is different about the digital money that we're seeing now is that one, you know, previously digital money was always created by financial institutions. These are institutions that would hold central bank money, right? As we think about also CBDCs, they take on liabilities to their customers. So when people are transferring digital money, you know, previously they would be transferring the liabilities of those institutions when uh, transacting online. And central bank money has never been digitally accessible for you and me, for the everyday person, right? We only have central bank money when we're dealing with physical cash in terms of possessing it in our own, uh, having it in our own possession. And as I'm sure you all have talked about today, if you've seen, right, the Bitcoin protocol, right, was really a catalyst uh, in mo digital money revolution, but it solved the double spending problem, but it really was a data revolution. And I th I'm going to come back to that, why that's an important distinction, right? The Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin protocol created something which really came out of computer science. It was a new a new way of transferring value or the the the, the data of value on the internet. So just keep that in mind, that Bitcoin brought about a data revolution more than a currency revolution. And so now we have side by side different money formats, whether they're finance, uh, mobile payments, online payments, Bitcoin is one, stable coins, right, that, that, that we're thinking a lot about today are one, and CBDCs are another format of digital money. So let's just keep all that in mind. We'll come back to that. And a big question is that I deal with a lot is, well, what does this mean for U.S. financial uh, coercion? Uh, now, I'm not going to talk so much about crypto. That's something that, that I can talk a lot about, but it's just because I have limited time, I want to dive into this from the standpoint of a nation state considering U.S. financial power sanctions, something that's in the news today, as, as, as I'm sure you're all uh, aware. I like to start with this slide that I put, put up, this picture that I put up back in 2017. This was a slide. I've been doing presentations for a while, and um, that is not a real quote. 
But I like to show it because back in 2017, when I started to follow Bitcoin, crypto, and Russia, Iran, other nations seeming to be interested in, in crypto, I thought about this quote. This is a fake quote. Don't anyone think this is real? Uh, just sort of in jest uh, that this could be a conversation between President Putin and at the then time, uh, President Rouhani of Iran. Again, both countries uh, dealing with U.S. sanctions, uh, that this might be the calculus. This might be how they are thinking about this data revolution, uh, that perhaps it could allow a way for them to get, again, uh, evade SWIFT or go, uh, not go through SWIFT. But really what that thought led me to as I started to research this issue, it was less about using Bitcoin. And I saw that these nation states were thinking about their own digital currency. And we see this today, which we'll touch on. In, 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 in Iran, in Russia, China, of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But it leads to an important question of really how much does this evade sanctions evasion, this move for a national digital currency? Um, is it really a threat or a risk? Well, let's dive deep into that. So the first thing is that, you know, not so fast, right? A central bank digital currency, the way it's uh, constructed or, or conceptualized today is still something, uh, still an instrument that would be vulnerable to U.S. sanctions. And it's a clear explanation because currently the way CBDCs are being modeled for the most part is they're really modeled on top of the banking system, right? Um, there's this idea of a two-tier model where uh, the second tier would be the banks, the payment companies, and that they are the ones responsible for the interface to users to use this new payment instrument, whether it's the ECNY or the digital ruble or, or the eNaira. And because banks are involved, you still have this relationship where the person still is going to have to go through an institution that cares about access to, to the to the uh, dollar market, to global, to have access to the dollar internationally. And so that's going to stunt the uh, ability or you know, the resilience of a country against sanctions because a digital, a central bank digital currency, as they are constructed now, uh, it doesn't seem like they would be too far removed from the banking system and that these banks, even if they're carrying the ECNY or the digital ruble, these banks still need access to the dollar. So they're not going to uh, be um, um, totally resistant or impervious to U.S. sanctions. So just, just keep that in mind. That's sort of the, sh the, the short-term constraint. But we are saying we must admit that we're in this environment where anyone can create a digital currency. That's why we're, we have our eye on this, right? Venezuela really sort of uh, kicked this off when back in 2017 or maybe it's 2018, they, they said uh, they would create this crypto coin called the Petro. And sp sp explicitly, they said it would help them um, uh, evade U.S. sanctions. And that was really a lot of hype, a lot of propaganda. It really didn't work work out. We see in Russia, I've been tracking how Russia has been piloting DLT projects for a while. The digital ruble is now something that's being tested. Um, and, and it's funny because even though I had that play quote with Russia and Iran, um, I found out or I noticed in either 2017 or 2018, economic leaders in Russia and Iran met and specifically said, specifically discussed um, uh, 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 blockchain technology coordination with the idea of evading sanctions. I mean, this was something that was actually mentioned in, in um, reports about uh, uh, bilateral meetings. And again, in Iran, doing a lot of blockchain research, um, their banks are experimenting with digital currency architecture and, and um, software. So again, this is sort of on the horizon that Iran is going to have its own digital currency, who knows, maybe in the coming year or so. And the, the, the big uh, the big state that we're all thinking about is the is China, of course, and the ECNY, which Jonathan really teed up. We're going to get more deeply into that. In fact, I'm going to uh, focus on what Jonathan um, Grady mentioned, which is the idea of this. Uh, well, why well, call it privacy with Chinese with Chinese Communist Party characteristics? And this is a screenshot. I always like this screenshot because this is a screenshot that was given in 2018, a slide from the PBOC, People's Bank of China, um, at a UN conference. And if you look right over here, uh, this talks about what this idea of controlled anonymity is. And this basically the, the the tables letting us know that the central bank will have identity information, trading information, other derivative information that 
could be a lot of different things for everyone using using it, right? Um, where the other uh, parts of the system will not have full access. This is a big deal. Some people say, oh, well, China always can have information and oh, there's always a lot of financial surveillance going on in the banking community. No, this is extremely different because the way financial monitoring works now is that um, regulators only have access to, let's say, a batch of um, transaction data, which comes from regulatory filings, suspicious activity reports. You know, you don't have this, even though the world may think that the government is surveilling everything, just the way the banking system works, it's, you don't have a government having full real-time access to all transactions in real time, but, you know, every the whole shebang, not just the, the, the suspicious activities. So this is really a new architecture that raises, as Jonathan mentioned, a lot of concerns about surveillance. But to me, the blueprint is pretty clear, even though we don't know um, there are a lot of details we don't know about this, you know, this, everything we've heard from the, the central bank of China lets us, I think we should assume that the government is going to have immense knowledge of people's transactions. And this is important because President Xi, a few years ago, said that data was a factor of production, that he sees data being a factor of production. I like to say that data is the new electricity, not even the new oil. So the new electricity, because um, in China, you know, data is seen as um, uh, the essential to a thriving digital economy. And China has a national fintech development plan. And the one the, from the previous three years says explicitly that the, that, that it's, uh, the government is dedicated to sort of building architecture where financial data is integrated, is collected, analyzed, and that there should be a national integrated data warehouse. I mean, everything, all the, the signaling is that data is to be collected, to be owned by the state, accessible by the the state. And then we could look at a lot of the Chinese, China data security laws that have been passed over the past year, again, which signal to the private sector that data in your company derived it by your company, if it's in China, whether you're a foreign company or domestic, must be accessible to the, to the government. That's all part of this fintech plan. And it's all part of this idea that data is part of, is a factor of production that the state needs to use. Now it's to learn from it. A lot of this is mundane and benign, right? Just uh, all the big data analysis. But obviously we can't you know, uh, take off our our geopolitical gla glasses, right? The geopolitics are are part and parcel of what the central bank is doing here. We can't um, neglect that or overlook that. But let's think about the short term versus the long term. That's really the question about CBDCs. You know, in the short term and the long term, the difference is going to be uh, uh, quite uh, the, the impact is going to be quite different. Here's something in the short term to think about, though. I will say that an ECNY in the short term actually does have a threat of economic retaliation against foreign companies. And, you know, what's good for the sanctioner is good for the sanction in the sense that China could actually use this wallet system to, to go against countries, other countries. Now, um, China calls the ECNY a backup system. And I actually think that that's not true. It's really a default system. You know, in in a lot of the terminal in in a lot of the language that the PBOC put out in its early research days, it said that the private fintech space was too big to fail, and that it, the the country needed a different alternative. And when you really sort of read between the lines, it's basically saying there needs to be a system that can be the government system that it really depends on and is really the backbone of the economy, not to um, cut out the private sector. But to, uh, but to have a system that it can rely on. And what is this h and I, I don't have time to get all into this example. But uh, what last year, the H&M clothing store, which is in Sweden, a European company, um, was pretty much retaliated against because the company had posted some uh, comments uh, in support of uh, the Uyghurs in, in uh, the Xinjiang region. And the Chinese government didn't like that. And reportedly, it seems what happened is that uh, the government influenced the private sector, the internet sector, to basically deplatform h and um, not to remove h and website, but to remove h and location. From, from geolocation apps and to remove H&M store uh, from the search results when you would look for H&M in Beijing and it says, you know, it does not exist. Basically getting rid of the footprint, the digital footprint of H&M in retaliation for that um, politically sensitive posting that the company made. Why do I mention that? That didn't have to do with the ECNY. But if we think about if H&M was forced to use ECNY, like many foreign com countries, I'm sorry, companies are, it, it, it seems quite plausible and quite likely that 
the central bank could switch off the uh, ECNY wallets of that foreign company if it does not comply. Um, it would have a much uh, d- more direct access to transactions and to wallets than it does in the current uh, private-led fintech payment system. So is this a new sort of sanctions methodology that could be in the work where you know what we're used to is treasury working through the banks and having to go through the banks and tell them, okay, sanction this customer, this person can't have an account, et cetera. But would it be a new system where um, accounts could be shut off just like the flip of a switch. You know, that's what I envision as a potential risk for companies that sort of join in the ECNY system. They should be thinking about that, foreign companies, that is. Um, here's how I like to describe it. Uh, uh, stick with me for this metaphor because I'm, I'm working on this. But this is what I would say that the conventional payment is payment system is where you have a bus is like the financial institution, where the passengers are, let's say, that the money is moving. And, and these are individual buses, and they sort of just carry uh, the, the funds from place to place. But these are sort of independent, detached and institutions. And when the government wants information on those funds or that data, the government has to knock on the door and, and hey, bus driver, open up and tell, you know, give me everything. I've got a subpoena. Give me everything about everything that you're carrying in your institution on this suspicious individual. That's how we have things today. I The way that I liken the ECNY is that the financial institution is really a trolley car, right? Where the wires above are the data linked to the PBOC. The trolley itself is part of the wiring. This is a new sort of system, right? It still looks like a a bus, but it's not a bus because it's connected to a bigger infrastructure, those wires, which are linked to the central bank. In, In the old system, it's not linked directly to the central bank. In the new system, it is. So then what does that mean? Well, it means that we we have a uh, a new architecture being built, right? We have a new infrastructure where all the institutions, if this were to be taken to its logical conclusion, all the institutions would be connected to the system. All the data transmitting through those vehicles, those institutions, goes to the central bank. Everything is now available to be analyzed by the PBOC, right? This is a different setup. This is, you know, I mean, it's funny. That's why when you're listening to the Chinese officials, right, and and they talk about it, right, they're not going to have the sensitivity that I would have about privacy. They're not going to, they're going to be, they're going to down, maybe downplay these risks. But it's important for you, for us, as you as students, you folks who are following these issues, to see the bigger picture, right? This is, uh, you know, this is, um, yeah, to see the bigger picture. Again, I mentioned the idea of this National Data Integration Center. Those words are sort of loosely Google, Google translated from the, from the National FinTech Data Plan. But it's clear, right, this idea of a digital economy needs uh, to have data and that uh, the government, the Chinese government, has a, a really a concerted strategic effort to leverage that data. And the FinTech Development Plan talks about using artificial intelligence on that data, um, for big data, uh, for big data analysis, and for that information to be spread and accessible to the government, and their commercial applications. I mean, there again, a lot of this is benign and mundane, right? You could probably help with uh, uh, traffic data. There's a whole bunch of things, uh, public health that, that we can talk about. But there's also the other side, right? There's also the surveillance side. There's also the political repression side. All of those things, because it's really leveraging the data for the power of the state. What the state thinks is important um, is going to be, uh, you know, its measure for how to use this data. So, um, you know, what do we have here? I mean, I, now I can touch even a little bit on the blockchain-based uh, service network. And to be real quick here, um, here's an example of maybe how China's approach can impact competition. Uh, compared to what other countries are doing. So self-driving cars, the, 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 the standard theory about how self-driving cars will share information is that the, the, that cars are going to share peer-to-peer linear, linearly. That is what, in terms of safety, I'm sorry, sharing data for safety. Um, and that's sort of the standard thought based on just using you know, conventional software and making sure they can ping each other. 
Um, but you know, I heard one of the blockchain service space network um, executives in China say that the way they envision using dis distributed ledger technology for self-driving cars is that instead of it being peer-to-peer, -peer, the data should be transmitted transmitted using blockchain technology, you know, in a broadcast manner where you're not pinging data from car to car, but data is available sort of 360 within the whole sphere or a certain geological area, all of that data is able to be collected because you're using a more distributed um, technology, a distributed data system so that the data is richer, the data is more fuller. You're not just pinging the cars that you can hit individually. You are actually tapping into the data that is being broadcast and it's like the, you know, you're getting a picture of everything and that you're doing AI based off of that. Now, that, again, this is sort of the concept, but what does it mean? It means that you you would be able to develop systems of analysis, systems of AI that are richer, that are, you know, could be linked to emergency response. It could be linked, you know, far and wide in a way that's just more sophisticated and more dynamic than just one-to-one -one pinging peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer linear data exchange. So, just take that as one example, and then you could extrapolate that to other areas of civic life, of business life, of commerce, of, of just transportation, of health. Um, you know, the vision in my, uh, the way I understand it is to have this more intelligent um, economy, a smarter system, a smarter digital economy. And this should make us think, as I'm going to kind of round up here to um, technological advancements that have happened year, you know, cent a century or so ago, right? If we think about the, you know, uh, Ford uh, uh, Model T, right? That was an innovation that uh, in the transportation, but uh, but what really was more significant wasn't the invention of that one car, but it was the invention of a system, a more dynamic system, which actually spread to other sectors, a, a system of assembly, of manufacture, an industrial system, right? It was this system that led to greater innovation, greater industrial innovation and economic innovation in the United States. So I use that as a bit of a parallel that that's how we should be thinking about a lot of this it's it's the search for new systems of economic um, activity and new models that china is trying to um to push forward in and we could say that that innovation is also happening in the us of course with other decentralized projects but the difference is that china is trying to lay the public infrastructure for that in a way that's difficult for a private company to in the same way right i mean think about the internet IBM didn't invent the internet. Mac and Apple didn't invent the internet, nor did Microsoft. Those were private companies. The internet was not a profit venture for 20, you know, for 20 years. It was a, something in the a backwater, you know, funded by the government, but it was these, these uh, researchers, academics that were iterating and building off of each other and doing research until they came up with an interoperable protocol. And I think that's what the, that's the strategy that China is taking with a lot of its blockchain technology investment to try to build that. Whereas here in the United States, often I think we're everyone is trying to build one blockchain to rule the other, you know, to rule them all. And uh, if IBM had tried to do that, I don't think we would have gotten the internet. So back to the issue of sanctions evasion in the short term, yeah. Not so much. I was on Coindesk today about this uh, TV, and that's the question. A lot of crypto folks are saying, oh, you know, Bitcoin is going to allow for sanctions evasion. And you can look at North Korea. North Korea is getting lots of money from hacking exchanges. I don't down, downplay that. But the key, though, is that this is sort of like low-hanging fruit, sort of small time, and there's there are more constraints on the on and off ramps. Um, so where that you know permissionless crypto is, I think, is just doesn't have the liquidity. It doesn't have what would uh, what let's say a Russia would need to offset the losses from the disruption to the banking system, especially if SWIFT was taken out of the picture. So short term, I'm not so worried. I do get worried when I think about sanctioned regimes or regimes that are adversarial and that really, really have incentive to undermine the U.S. Fi US financial conversion, them getting together and building and developing. Now, this, you know, maybe it's not going to happen overnight, but in the long term, this is where I think more of the concern is that an alternative value transfer system exists 
which totally um, uh, which is out of the hand of banks, and that th- that um, banks are less important. And so it's funny we see some of that happening because correspondent banking is declining; it's getting more difficult, more expensive. So you have all these factors sort of happening where you know maybe a few years ago we never would have said, oh well, you know the the global banking system would never sort of fall out of favor. But again, we see all these push pushes and pulls. Um, that are happening, uh, and and you know, there's this is something for us to be thinking thinking about. So the ECNY, yeah, it's still in its pilot stage, um, uh, you know, but we know a pilot can become something greater. The ECNY may not, maybe it won't be adopted, but even if it's not adopted, maybe it falls flat. Maybe China doesn't incentivize users to use it enough uh, over uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay. But really, the thing to think about is that with this pilot. China is gaining a lot of data to analyze. This is an experiment and it's learning because now, if you think about it, the smallest bit of transactions, even with, with, these, with this, this small rollout during the Olympics, all of that is data. All of that is allowing China to be able to learn from it and maybe figure out what a better uh, deployment of a digital currency would be, or to you know rejigger things a little bit and come back with um, with a version two, you know, a two point of the ECNY in the coming you know months. So it doesn't really. It's not that it doesn't matter, but just realize it's not all about if the ECNY takes off in twenty twenty two. That's not the question. It's what sort of data does China gain from this experiment, and where are other countries uh, uh, in that? So. I like to frame frame the threats as a surveillance threat versus a competition threat. You know, these are sort of different issues, and most people latch on to the the surveillance threat uh, because that is, I think, that's the most evident, right? It's pretty clear that that uh, that that managed anonymity is going to be managed by the the central bank, meaning the the Chinese Communist Party will basically have a strong hand in. Uh, learning from transactions and impacting transactions. But the long term is this threat of competition. Now, and again, it's not necessarily the ECNY itself, but but all of these uh, experiments and all of this fintech um, advancement, I think, risk to give China an edge that other countries are going to have to compete with. So I'll end with a few thoughts like, you know, Back in the day, right, for centuries, it was access to gold. That was clearly what differentiated you as a national power. Then for the past, you know, several decades, it's been what? The ability to hold the U.S. dollar. I'm wondering if we're getting to a stage in our national and geopolitical development where the holding of data and the harnessing of data is going to be key. Who has the data, who has the best data, who can analyze the data, and who can sort of uh, leverage that data for the economy. Um, It doesn't mean that all three of these things are not going to be important, but it's just that this data piece is becoming of utmost important, and it's interesting to see what happens. So we're going to, the standards going to be set it's interesting if you think about the different bodies that are the researching CBDCs, the Bank for International Settlement Settlements is key. The BIS, think about it, is more. Someone told me, you know, because I was thinking about like the IMF versus the BIS. You know, the U.S. has a huge role in the IMF. The BIS, people tell me, is more like one central bank, one vote. So if the BIS is moving forward with central with uh, central bank. CBDC research and cross-border payment systems and all these pilots that the BIS is doing, um, uh, that entity may be less influenced by U.S. standards or by you know by 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 U.S. Um, desires or inputs, right? So China is very involved in BIS. Uh, its central bank is is I think providing a lot of good a lot of suggestions, not necessarily good suggestions, but a lot of suggestions, uh, making suggestions about standards. So this is an area to watch. And I'll end with that same 2018 presentation, which um, the PBOC had. This is from this is their slide. And this, it, you know, this is the ending slide of basically saying, you know, flagging this Economist article, which was about great power competition, and it talked about technology um, uh, as you know between China and the U.S. and, and Russia, and look at how they, you know, China is framing it: robotics, oops, robotics, AI, big data, digital currency are all part of a thread, right? All part of a step 
um, and going to um, digital currency, digital currency being like a critical part of this technological innovation and geopolitical co um, competition. So the Gutenberg press, people talk about that. I would say that FinTech, it's all about the data, that that's the next stage. And if we're gonna think about the short term and the long term, we need to have a long-term plan if we're, if those who are those of us in US policy circles, that's what I think we're thinking about. China's digital currency strategy uh, is ban crypto, right? And then create a CBDC that is pretty much wired into surveillance. That is the CCP approach. But I, you know, I, I think what we have to see in the US is that these different digital currencies and digital digital money formats are simply different tools in the toolkit, have different use cases. They're going to be here. You can't ban them. You can't get rid of them. The key is to figure out how they fit. How do stable coins fit? How should they be regulated? How, do, do, how does uh, Bitcoin fit? How should it be regulated? And what's the role of CBDCs if it should be deployed? The key question is managing financial integrity and privacy in this digital world, in a new digital economy that is evolving. That is going to be the key. And what is our strength? If we're going to think about what should the US approach be? Our strength is really this understanding of privacy and having the foundational elements against uh, unreasonable search and seizure um, and having a court system and a legal system. Uh, those are the buffers from uh, the buffers against digital authoritarianism. And we're going to have to figure out how all of that techno how technology, privacy technology can fit into this digital economy that we're moving towards because we can't have it all surveillance like China. So we're going to have to make advancements in privacy technology and figure out how that fits in to the policy if we're going to have a CBDC. So, hey, if you're following the geopolitical game, it's still going to be a cat and mouse game. It's still going to be different players check, you know, checking one against the other. The aim is to stay ahead of the game. And, um, uh, and it's all about the data. That's the mantra that I'll leave you with. And with that, I will stop sharing. And it's been great. Uh, oops, let me stop sharing. Sorry. Uh, Thank you so much, Yaya. That was just a, get, a fantastic wrap up to uh, a really absolutely fascinating day. And, and you addressed many, many of the questions we raised this morning. In fact, we, we started the day with four or five questions around DeFi from efficiency to diversity to laws of finance to risk and geopolitics. And we're ending on kind of a very broad note, which is super, super helpful. So thank you so much, Yaya. That was that was great. So for all of you, I hope you all enjoyed the, the very substantive DeFi topics that we explored today and also enjoyed just meeting the variety of incredibly interesting and talented people working on our most profound DeFi challenges and, and opportunities. I want to extend a really warm and appreciative thanks to our sponsors, and all our panelists and speakers who went out of their way to make a really fantastic conference today. And I want to give a special shout out to the assistant director of the Fubon Center, Liz Chen, who many of you have had the occasion to meet during the process of conference planning, and to the many people behind the scenery who helped make this possible. We are very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. And to all of you in the audience, please consider yourself uh, a newfound member of the ever-growing NYU FinTech community. Thank you for your support. Please follow us on Instagram at NYU Stern uh, Fubon Center. And thank you for your support and very good luck in your fintech future. Have a great, great afternoon and evening.